Veterans Conference both refreshed and worn flat out. And we both looked at each other and said, we get an extra hour of sleep tomorrow. And I went to sleep with my little mask thinking, it's going to be a good night. It was, but not the night that I thought it was going to be. God woke me up at 4 a.m. and changed the direction of the word this morning. And as we've been worshiping and singing these songs, I understand why. That last song that my craving singing, he's not finished yet. Amen. I think there's a myriad of people in this building right now that can relate to the words of the song that we just sang. Amen. Wednesday night in our cluster at my house. By the way, if you don't have a place to go on Wednesday nights, we'd love to host you at our home. I, I absolutely love our Wednesday night cluster. And we started in Romans chapter 18. And this verse has just been sticking with me. It says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Some versions say to us or for us. I want to read that again. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Later on in this chapter, there's a verse that everybody knows this one. For we know this, that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. All things work together for the good. I consider that the sufferings of this present time. I don't know if you are catching the theme here. But before you can get to the glory that's to be revealed, there's some suffering. Before you can get to God working things out for our good, there are some things. We don't, nobody likes walking through things. And especially, none of us particularly enjoy sufferings. As a matter of fact, oftentimes we define those terms as up against it, between a rock and a hard place, depressed, discouraged, empty, at the end of my rope, hopeless. Struggling and a myriad of other words. And it seems like our goal for each day is survival. It's survival. It's striving. Nothing's coming easy. Am I talking to the rock crowd this morning? <clears throat> But I got some good news because this is what the Lord woke me up with at 4 a.m. He says, I want to bring my people from survival into revival. And I want to move my people from striving to thriving. I woke up at 4 a.m. on a day that I really wanted to sleep in, but I'm really glad he woke me up. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. And I want to give you some steps. To move from survival to revival. Because in Exodus chapter 14, there is a very familiar passage in the Bible about the Red Sea. And we're going to break that apart a little bit. But I want you to look at where this started. They are proverbially between the rock and the hard place. They are seemingly in a desperate, hopeless situation. And the story ends with a national worship service of everybody dancing on the side of a river with their hands lifted. Now that's a big jump from one side of the river yep. down in it complaining, oh man, Egypt sure was good, wasn't it? To the other side of the river 
somebody grabs a tambourine and leads the entire nation in praise and worship to God. That's moving from survival into reviving. That's moving from striving into thriving. What did they do? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're speaking on today. That stopped being funny about two years ago. <laughs> I say that all the time. I'm noticing diminishing my time. <laughs> Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 14 of Exodus. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi. You know, we call Elizabethtown E-Town in these parts. We're going to call this Pi Town. <laughs> and between Migdal and the sea. And in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. Now, thank God that this story does not end right there. Amen. Think about pursuing the Lord in prayer and him telling you, all right, here's what we're going to do. Lord, show me your will. Show me direction, Father. Lord, I just need to hear from you. Okay, go camp over there by the sea. Between Pi Town and Bel Zephon, okay? And when you get there, the guy that you've been serving for these hundreds of years, Pharaoh, I'm going to harden his heart and they're going to pursue you. So you're going to have the Red Sea on one side and then this entire army of Egypt, the most powerful army in the entire world on this side. If I was Moses, how would you have taken that word? Oh. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to need a confirmation on that one. <laughs> I'll lay a fleece of a sheep out on the ground this morning. <laughs> Let everything else be wet. No, that was Gideon. That wasn't them. That was the word of the Lord there. God was leading these people into one of the most seemingly difficult situations that anybody could be in in that time. And it was done by the hand of God. Now, don't misunderstand my theology. I'm not saying all your suffering is coming from God. That's not it at all. But I think it's fairly clear here that God's the one at the driver's seat. Is he not? Okay, camp here, and just so it will be pretty awesome, I'm going to harden the heart of the commander of this entire army, and they're going to chase you. Good, 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 that's good. But it doesn't end there. And he says this, I will get glory over them and his host, and all of them will know that I'm the Lord. I told you to get to glory, to get to the future glory, to get to the working out for the good, we're going to have to walk through some things. See, we want the glory without the suffering. We want the working out without the struggles, without the things. We want the crown without ever having to walk to a cross. That's how we're built, because we deserve it after all, aren't we? I mean, we're pretty awesome. It's what we deserve. But the first thing, if you're in a battle for your life, if you're striving, if you're surviving today, if you came in here on fumes, the first step in Exodus chapter 14 to moving into revival is to have a hopeless situation. Isn't that wonderful? To see the hand of God move in an entire nation. See the glory of the Lord. Step one, have a situation that's dire and hopeless. How many people can say, I am right this morning? That's me. <laughs> Guess what? Praise God. Oh, I never thought about it that way. I know. Neither have I. God's vision is never 
her vision, though. <laughs> sea in front of them, army behind. Clowns to the left of them, jokers to the right. <laughs> But the God perspective was something completely different. While the children of Israel were looking at a sea and an army, God was looking at the two of them together and seeing an army in a sea. So he was already looking at the victory because his perspective was something different. He was looking at bringing his name on her. Man, I can't get off of this here lately. <laughs> Notice again. God led them there. God hemmed them in. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why on earth would he do that to somebody he loves? Well, he tells us the answer. I'm going to hem you in and make it look pretty desperate, okay? And not a person alive is going to like it. I've noticed that about trials. There's been very few of them that I've really thought, this is a lot of fun. I love it. <laughs> Wish I could have a double portion of the suffering. <laughs> now, we want the double portion of the anointing of the blessing. But don't give me a double portion of that suffering. But God was orchestrating every bit of it. You can't be I'm hardening his heart. I'm sending him against you. Why? <laughs> Because I will get glory over him, and the entire nation will know that I'm the Lord. Not just you, the Egyptians. How to move from survival to revival. Have a hopeless situation. Let's continue. Verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what on earth have we done letting Israel go? That's the Richie version. Why did we do that? Stupid, stupid, stupid. And they woke up like, we're going to have to start doing all the work that they were doing. I don't want to do that. Why did we do that? So he made his chariot ready and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt. That's a bunch of chariots. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who hardened the heart of Pharaoh? Huh. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? See, we would think, oh, God softens the heart. Not in this case. He hardens the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and he overtook them and camped at the sea by Pie Town in front of Bel Zephon. So guess what? It happened just like God said it would happen. You can't hear it. Just hang out here for a while. There's going to be an army coming after you. But don't go anywhere. Get stuck. Okay. First step, have a hopeless situation, and it happens just like God said it does. I've noticed that about God when he speaks. It's going to come to pass. But verse 10, look at this. When Pharaoh drew near, this is a place I can relate to a lot. Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. Let me tell you, church, when trials and sufferings come, fear is a natural reaction, but it's not the supernatural reaction that God wants us to have. Because he told us in his word, he's not given us a spirit of fear. And I know that you have been afraid at times, hearing a diagnosis, hearing a report, hearing something that somebody has said. It's a fearful thing in our natural minds, and that's where Israel was. They got to the place, they were scared senseless. They're sitting there and there's an army, probably half of them know how to swim. That wasn't funny at all. There's no boats. And they get afraid because the army, it looks hopeless. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now this is something fascinating. Because this is such a mimic of my reactions as a human being. When I get to that hopeless situation, fear, and look what's followed out next. Complaining. 
me. They called out to Moses. And all Moses did was obey God. And they said to Moses, Is there because there were no graves in Egypt, you've taken us away to die in this wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we can serve the Egyptians. And it would have been better for us to serve them than to die in this wilderness. Notice these two reactions in the hopeless situation. Fear. Enemy arrow number one. And he uses it in every situation. He tries to put fear on us. And then because of our unhappiness in the situation, then the mouth starts running. And if you're anything like me, which I pray you're not, my mouth is about ten times faster than my brain. It just starts running. And I'll start talking. And it's contagious, man. It just starts spewing out. James is right. Who can tame the tongue? Not this guy. And when I get unhappy in a situation, I don't like this at all. And I'll try to put on a front and act like I happened. You know, I'm okay. But on the inside, Jenny bears the brunt of it at home. This just stinks. I hate this. Blah, 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 blah. Well, before you judge me too bad, the entire nation of Israel did it, so get off my back. <laughs> and I'm, that's just what our flesh does when we're dissatisfied with something. We get to the place where I don't like this. Yeah. Amen. This is terrible. And listen at the absolutely crazy comments that they make to Moses. Hey, we've been in slavery for 400 years. And they had really good graveyards there. They were beautiful. They were ornamental. They decorated them. Had a New Orleans jazz band walking through, you know. They were beautiful funerals there. Yeah, we were dying in slavery, but what a beautiful graveyard. I would have rather been in that graveyard and been celebrated there than to die in this stinking wilderness. And then it gets personal to Moses. What have you done to us? <laughs> First step, you got to have a hopeless situation. We're talking this morning about moving from survival into revival. See, everybody wants the revival. And if you really want revival, listen to me this morning because this will lead us straight there. The first thing you have to do is have a hopeless situation. The second thing that you have to do and realize is that you can't do anything to get yourself out of this. Glory. That wasn't the word I was thinking, but it fits. That's the right word. When I find myself out of control, I need to be shouting glory, but I don't like it. It kind of hurts when you realize that you're a control freak and don't want anybody to know that. Amen. Because we want to control every single situation. And when it gets out of our control, we lose control. Is anybody else with me? Tom's right, praise God. You get to the place you go, I can't fix this. I can't do one. Name one thing the army of Israel could have done to get themselves out of that situation. Not a thing on earth. God himself had placed them right in that place. That's it. God himself had placed them in this place. And no matter what they did, how they wiggled, how they thought, how hard they prayed, how hard they had a war room meeting and a strategy room, not anything they did could get them out of that place. Have a hopeful situation and a realization that you can't do anything to fix it. So the third thing you do is you remove yourself from the equation. How much do you think God actually needs you? Think about 
I, I know that hurts your pride. It hurts mine too. God saved a nation from the mouth of a donkey. drink from a rock. Yep. How much do you think you're essential to God's kingdom? Let me tell you something. It is an honor to be a part of what God's doing. It's a privilege to be a part of what God's doing. We need to stop thinking that we are the key. What God needs from us is to get us out of the way. And a lot of times when things get desperate, we become our own worst enemy. Yeah, that's right. Instead of placing ourselves in a place where we can let God move, we jump in there and i got to fix it, got to fix it, got to fix it, got to fix it. And guess what? Us as men, it's a broad brush stroke. We are the worst fixers in the world. Yeah. Because I have to fix it, don't you? Yeah. And when I can't fix it, I'm miserable. And I am like a truck stuck in the mud. And I'm not smart enough to get my foot off the gas. And it just digs deeper and deeper and deeper. And it keeps throwing mud all over everybody. But Dad and Abbott, I'm getting out of this. Until I get so deep. <laughs> Anybody else? You're just that stubborn. I'm getting out of this. Ain't no mud going to beat me. I'll tell you that right now. Me and you're just stuck. <laughs> mowing a little bit this summer and I got stuck in a ditch and I thought that oh, I'll get out of this, no big deal no big deal, got this zero turn <laughs> man that thing is spinning man these sound effects are amazing this I got that thing so deep in there it took hours Have a hopeless situation. Realize you can't do anything to get yourself out of it. So because of that, remove yourself from the equation. See, as they're complaining, here's what Moses said. Fear not. See, they were afraid. Did they not? Were they not? They were afraid. And Moses said, wipe that fear off of your face. Sounds like something my dad would say when I was yeah. in trouble as a kid. You wipe that off your face. <laughs> Fear not. Stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord. Which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today... <laughs> You're not ever going to see them again. The Lord will fight for you. Oh no, I hate this part. And you just need to be silent. <laughs> Moses basically spanks an entire nation. Get that fear off of your face and stop that complaining and just shut your everybody because God's about to do something glory <laughs> removing ourselves is difficult but Moses' word I say God's word to this nation had zero to do with the abilities of these people with the desperation they were in how difficult it seemed the outlook all the word of the Lord was is just stand here. Man, that's hard. That's hard. We're talking about moving from survival into revival. We're talking about moving out of striving into thriving. 
You know, if you're happy waking up every morning and surviving, see, that's even a common phrase we use today. How are you doing? Oh, I'm surviving. That's not good enough. I don't want to survive. I mean, I do. Don't misunderstand me. But I want to get into the glory and get out of the suffering. Amen. And I think you do too. First thing you have to do, though, is have a situation that's hopeless. Step one, check. Point two, realize that you can't do anything to get yourself out of it. Check. So remove yourself from the equation. Fear not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, he'll work for you. Just remove yourself. Realize God doesn't need you for the victory. What he does need is this. Here's the fourth step. Now this is something that's very key from moving, from surviving into thriving, from actually getting from the suffering into glory. you got to get a word from the Lord. I can't tell you how many times I was in a fire and nothing changed, but a word from the Lord got me through that. Amen. Guys, we've got to have a word to stand on because there's times that's all you have. And if you don't have a word, you're going to be shifting all over the place. Whatever it takes to hear the Lord... Study the word. Pray, 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 pray. Seek his face and get a word from the Lord. <clears throat> Here was the word of the Lord. He told him, stand still. That was the removal of themselves. The word of the Lord was, you're not going to see these people again. This will be the last day you do with this. Now, I don't know about you. But that would be encouraging to me in some of the sufferings I'm going through right now. For the Lord to speak into it and say, Richie, this is the last day that you will ever have high blood pressure. Woo! Praise Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> this is the last day you will struggle with this. This is the last time that you will have to look this thing in the face. That's their word from the Lord. Amen. Praise Amen. the name of Jesus. Glory. Man, as they're standing between the rock and the hard place, God says, ah, it's the last day you'll have to deal with this this time. I know for centuries you've been serving them, and they have been just an absolute pain in your neck. It ends today. Guess what? There was still an army that was looking at him. There was still an army that was looking at them and staring at them and hating them. And God says, this is over. Imagine that as they're looking down their sights at you, an entire army, every chariot in the nation of Egypt is there facing against you and all the horsemen and the infantry and the cavalry and Pharaoh, and they're all there and all their stuff. And God said, oh, yeah, this is done. And a bunch of slaves are, oh, I can't, we can't get it. This, this is it. So, it is essential for us in our suffering, if we're going to get to the place of the future glory, to realize it's the word of the Lord that will bring us there, and not what you can do in your own might, because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by His Spirit. And what we need more than anything is a word from the Lord to stand on. So he says, this is it. And the Lord said to Moses, uh, why are you why are you crying? That sounds like a daddy comment as well. Dry it up! <laughs> Before I give you something to cry about. No, he didn't say that. No, he say that. Why are you crying? What is wrong with you? Go forward. Amen. So he tells them, you won't see these people again. Go forward. Now I ask you, how 
do you go forward into a situation of impossibility? My dad used to tell me something, and it stuck with me all these years. It's hard to steer a bicycle that's not moving. As I've gotten stuck in situations, he would tell me, start pedaling. And if you miss it, God can redirect you. You can't steer something that's sitting still. See, what we do when we get into those sufferings, though, we throw our hands up. I'm done. Cal gone, take me away. Remove this from me, Lord. See, God's the one that's working, and we've already proven he doesn't need us. But when he speaks, they've got a word from him. And the word was, you won't see him again. That should be motivation to go forward. And then he says this. I love God so much because the things he says literally makes no sense in my mind. And I've understood something about God that my understanding is really not a prerequisite to him doing what he wants to do. Okay, Moses, dry it up. Go forward. Uh, God, there is kind of an ocean there. Uh, there's a sea. Go forward. Lift your staff up and point it over that water over there and divide it. And the people will go through it. tell you something. If you're waiting on something that makes absolute sense to your carnal mind, you're going to be stuck in suffering a long time. The word of the Lord was, this is over right now. Go forward, dry it up, stop crying. Take that stick in your hand and hold it out over the water and divide it. God, this really isn't like a little... Uh, I don't even have broke faith this morning. This is a sea. <coughs> but he had a word from the Lord. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. He had a word from the Lord. This is over. Do this. And do that. Uh, okay, Lord. And then verse 17, I'll harden the hearts of these people and they'll go in after you and I'll get glory over them and his chariots and horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I'm the Lord and I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Mm. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them in a pillar of cloud and it moved before them and stood behind them. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel, and there was a cloud in the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night long. Now comes the moment. Remember, we're moving from survival into revival. They had a hopeless situation that they couldn't get themselves out of, so they removed themselves from the situation. They got a word from God. And next, there's only one thing left. Well, actually, there's a second get to, but there's only one thing to getting into this victory. Obey. Amen. Obey. Yeah. Obey what God tells you to do. And sometimes, even though you know it's a word from the Lord, it's the hardest part. <laughs> it's the action that to everything else that has led us up to this point, it's actually walking through with it. See, there's some in here right now. You know, let me give you a great example financial struggle. And God says, hey, start tithing. Oh, God, I can't do that. That don't make sense. Well, okay. We'll continue to struggle until you decide to obey. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. God, I'm really struggling. Hey, get just so, so $500 into Chris Harwood. Just do it. I, I Just do it. Lord, we can't pay our bills this month. That doesn't make sense. You don't think that makes sense. Try it going forward through a sea and lifting a stick up over the water. <laughs> Lord, I'm 
thirsty. Okay, just go down and lick that rock and some water will come out. <laughs> I'm good. See, oftentimes God just requires us to do things that make absolutely no sense to us. But not making sense is not an excuse to disobey what God's told you to do. See, and he's even there in the midst of it, urging them on, you know. You won't see him again. Stop your crying. Lift up your stick. Walk on through. God, I don't know if I can do that. These people are looking at me. I'm the leader. I've got the stick. I'm the leader. God, they're looking at me. Just do it. Here, let me give you a little encouragement. See this cloud? I'll surround you. Now get up there. See, all that's left is obeying what God tells you to do. So Moses stretches out the hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night, and he made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. Now, I'm tired of being the last one in the water. <laughs> you know... I think God's getting me to the place to start stepping in when it's still wet. Expecting and knowing that his word's going to come to pass anyway. Hey, I'm tired of being a late adopter. Oh, okay, we're having a good worship. Everybody's dancing. Okay, I'll dance now. I get me. <laughs> That's a one hop. <laughs> the extent of my dancing. There's also a robot. It's <laughs> done. But when God says something, I want to be the first one out of the boat like Peter. I want to be the first one. Okay, Lord, walk on through. Man, this hurts, God. I don't like how this looks, but let's go forward. Glory. And if it takes me getting down to my waist before the waters part, they're coming because he said it was going to happen. Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> See, now we're starting to feel it, you know, get into revival. We want the revival. See, the first half of the sermon really stinks to have to do those things. But it's so important to get to where we are right now. Yes. The cloud comes back. Man, we want to see the glory of the Lord. Yes. We don't want to have to walk through anything to see it, but we want to see the glory of the Lord. I'm telling you, whatever you have to walk through to see it, it's worth it. Yes. And there they are, man. The waters divide. And then the Israelis, the Israelites, same, same difference. <laughs> wow. Okay, walking forward. <laughs> okay, I got this. Got it now. Mm -hmm. I think they even job. <laughs> Because they heard the word of the Lord. Hear me, church. Because this isn't just about walking through a Red Sea. This is walking through what you're walking through right now. It's the same protocol. It's the same principles. And it's not going to be any easier for you than it was for them. You're in a place of desperation. Praise God. With God, nothing is impossible. It's the most fertile ground for a move of God. Lord, I'm hanging on by a thread. Good, here I come. Amen. Lord, I don't can't do this anymore. Perfect. Here I am. Lord, I don't even want... Oh, I don't need your strength, son. Here I am. Glory. God, I can't make it through another day. I don't need you to. They realize 
once they were stuck, left to themselves, so they removed themselves, got a word from the Lord, and they obeyed it. Woo! I told you I woke up at four. <clears throat> Who needs an extra hour of sleep anyway? Glory. Guys, I'm telling you, this is not a sermon. God woke me up at 4 a.m. And it wasn't just to preach this. It's to let you know He's wanting to move you into this place. Amen. 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 I know it stinks. I know the suffering's hard, but it can't even be compared to the glory that's coming. So they're walking on through. And the Egyptians pursued them, just like God said, in the midst of the sea. And Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen in the morning watch of the Lord. And the pillar of fire and of a cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces, and he threw them into a panic. Who threw them into a panic? It was God. Clogging their chariot wheels, it started getting muddy again. And they drove heavily so that the wheels got stuck. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel. For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. I don't know about you. I'm tired of being pursued from the enemy. It's time for him to run from us. Amen. These attacks... That's coming against us. It's time for them to hit the road. Yes, sir. Because the same thing is true. The Lord still fights for us. Yes. You're not fighting this alone. As a matter of fact, stop fighting. The Lord fights for you. Yes. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea. You know the stick? It'll work again. And the water may come upon the Egyptians and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and it returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw them into the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. I love this. Not one of them remained. See, we started today in communion. Finality. He doesn't do stuff halfway. He doesn't leave a little lingering thing. Not one of them remained. See, we're starting to get into the place of revival. And it started with desperation hanging on by a thread between the rock and a hard place. Discouraged, depressed, hurting, suffering. And now we're at a place it's gone forever. Just like that. And the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Bodies washing up on the seashore. And Israel saw the great power of the Lord against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord. Now let me tell you something about fear. It started with them fearing the Egyptians. He's not given us a spirit of fear. But there is a place we need to fear and it's the presence of the Lord. <laughs> fear the Lord's beginning of wisdom. That's the only thing you need to fear. FDR was wrong. It's not the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. The only thing you have to fear is God himself. And they believed in the Lord and in the servant of Moses. Uh, the servant, Mo, his servant Moses. Isn't that such a powerful, powerful chapter in the Bible? That starts in one place, that ends in another. Desperation. 
realizing they can't do anything to get themselves out of it, so they intentionally remove themselves from the situation, and they get a word from God, and they obey it. And now all that's left is fun. Moses began to sing. I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. For the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots, they've been cast into the sea, and His chosen officers have sunk in the Red Sea. They've been covered by the floods, and they went down into the depths. And He goes on and on and on. then his sister says, oh, we're not done yet. Don't you love those worship services where you sit down? It's like, oh, we're not done yet. That's what happens. <laughs> They're singing this song, and she's like, I kind of like that. And she picks up a tambourine. That's a tambourine. She starts worshiping. Moses, that was good. Somebody, somebody copyright that with CCLI, so that's not stolen. <laughs> I will sing unto the Lord, for he is trying gloriously. The horse of the rider is thrown into the sea. We put music to it. Great, Harry. I like that. That's a catchy little thing. That's awesome. And they had a glory filled revival moment in the victory and glory of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? How many people are ready for our time together? to be some victory moments in the glory of the Lord. Yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. I got some news for you. Before we get there, there's some things we got to do. You might have to walk through something to get there. It's worth it. I guarantee you, at that time, man, when she's dancing with that tambourine, singing out with all of her might, when Moses is leading the congregation and an entire nation turned their complaining into praise, their thoughts were, well, last night was rough, wasn't it? Man, I didn't hardly get any sleep. We had to walk through that river. That army looked ugly, didn't they? No, they were thanking God for what he had done. What does that mean? That the current sufferings, they can't even compare to the future. Yeah. Richard, you don't know the intensity of the fire I'm in right now. The intensity of your fire, turn it up a million degrees, that's going to be the intensity of your glory. Because the Lord is true. See, this present suffering to the glory that's going to be revealed to you. As hard as of a night that was, as hard of a 400 years that was in slavery to these old Egyptian coots. Is that a bad word? I don't think so. I'm sorry. I said that on oh, Forgive me if it is. Cusses. How about that? Egyptians. Let's leave it at that. We'll agree. If that's how bad it's been for 400 years this thing's gone on. Oh, this is over tonight, though. Man, they had something to worship for. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is trying gloriously. Horse and rider thrown into the sea. Man, God is good. He's good, church. See, if we're going to move from survival 
the revival, if we're going to leave the land of surviving and start thriving, we got to get ourselves out of the way as we walk through some stuff. we got to know how to get a word from the Lord and obey it to the T. And when that happens, wait for the victory and return that glory back to Him. I noticed in Moses' song, it was all God-focused. The Lord has done this. The Lord fights for us. The Lord. After the victory, Moses never tried to steal any of that back and say, you know what, I got the magic stick, everybody. <laughs> this is the one. This is the stick. I'm the guy. See these hands? Split water. Just the hands. That's so stupid. But it's amazing how we glorify the serpents today. <laughs> There's nothing that makes me want to vomit more than the spotlight getting off of God and the glory going to someplace else. It goes to Jesus and to Him alone. The Lord has done this. Don't think I had anything to do with this congregation. I was scared too. The Lord fought for you. The Lord did this. He is my salvation. He is my shield. He fights for me. Praise you, Jesus. We're going to move into revival, which is what we want. I'm tired of surviving. I'm tired of getting by. I'm tired of suffering. I'm tired of being discouraged, depressed, pressed down. Beaten at the end of my rope, hopeless, in despair and discouragement. Praise God. That's not a bad thing, church. I know it hurts our feelings and hurts our flesh to walk through it, but it's not a bad thing because God comes on the scene and just like He did it for them because they were his chosen people. God's not a respecter of persons. You question God's love for you? That he won't do something for you as well? God abandoned me in the wilderness. God made me camp in a place and an army came after me. I don't think I can go to church today. <laughs> That's so dumb. I've just been walking through so much. I'm going to stop. <laughs> you get the point. God has not failed us. Father, you woke me up early this morning and changed the direction of this day and your Holy Spirit knew what was going on. Even by the songs we sang, Lord, we'll praise before our breakthrough until my song becomes my triumph. God, we're tired of the suffering and the surviving. We're overcomers, Lord. And if we walk through the fire, we'll walk through the fire, Lord. Speak to us now. Lord, you're going to explode in this place. Man, I can feel your Holy Spirit right now. Whew. 